Good afternoon and welcome. Oops, there's that notification. Good afternoon and welcome. Thanks for joining our webinar today. I own the prize, what every first time GC should know. Today we'll be hosting a discussion with two general counsel, learning their best advice and sharing what they wish they had known when they first took the GC role. Before I turn this over to my host and colleague, um, Adina Beasley, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping items. You should be able to see the screen right now and hopefully hear my voice. All attendees are in listen-only mode for the duration of the presentation. And as a reminder, the call is being recorded. The recording will be on our website in the next few days. We expect this event to be one hour, including Q&A. You can ask a question at any time throughout the event and we encourage you to do so. At the top right of your screen is the GoToWebinar panel. Just open up the console, type a question, and hit submit. Adina will monitor the Q&A throughout and insert where relevant. All questions will be anonymous and we will not share your name or identity with the rest of the audience. At the close of today's webinar, a survey will pop up on your screen. We hope that you'll take it. It's short, about, it should take about one minute, two minutes tops and will let us know how we did today and other, career, other topics you'd like to hear from us in the future. Lastly, um, this webinar was a result of trends MLA had seen in the industry over the past two years. During that time, 650 plus US general counsel have assumed their role for the first time. To help the GCs acclimate, we did a survey to general counsel asking them for their best advice. You can find in the handout section um, of the GoToWebinar console a um, report on that first time GC as well as an infographic. You should be able to see like the flashing arrow if it worked right now um, and you can download it. We'll also send it to you after the call in case you're unable to download it here. So with that said and without further ado, let me turn this over to my colleague Adina who will set up today's conversation and introduce our panelists. Thank you so much, Heather. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think we had over 200 people registered for today's webinar, and I believe 30 to 40 of them were um, identified as first-time GCs. So welcome. Thanks for being with us. Um, I'm Edina Beasley, Managing Director in um, Major Lindsay and Africa's in-house counsel recruiting group. I focus on general counsel and chief legal officer searches. And given my focus on those high-level legal searches, I get a lot of questions about how to, how to prepare for a GC role and, and what to do kind of within those first few months or the first year in order to be successful um, in the role. And it was one of those conversations, it was a conversation with a law firm candidate um, who, um, who had never been in house before. He got recruited by one of his clients to be their next general counsel. So he called me and he was super excited and he was nervous and he was hoping to get a GC playbook or a cheat sheet, if you will, on sort of how to navigate those first few months, his first year, and kind of what to do to be successful um, in the role. I had no playbook and I had no cheat sheet for him. I spent some time with him on the phone. Um, he's still in the role. He is a successful general counsel. But it was that conversation and those types of conversations that really prompted us here at MLA to conduct our first time GC survey. That's the survey that Heather just mentioned. Uh, we really, um, we tried to get uh, advice from sitting GCs. We surveyed over 150 GCs and asked them to share their best advice and kind of tell us what they wish they had known before they took the role. And in addition to that survey, we also thought it would be, it would be great to do what we're doing today, which is having a chat with two successful GCs and really hearing directly from them what it means to be a successful GC, sort of their career path and, and things they learned along the way um, on becoming, becoming GCs. So um, this is not a presentation. We don't have any slides or handouts other than the GC survey report that, that Heather put in the chat. Um, it's really going to be a conversation with my wonderful panelists and please, as Heather mentioned, feel free to ask questions and I will do my best to monitor the chat, chat box and uh, kind of incorporate the questions as we go. And with that, I'll turn it over to my wonderful panelists, Ivana Levine and Leslie Cleaver. Um, Leslie, do you want to start us off with just a quick introduction maybe about 
two minute overview of your career just so our uh, attendees can get to know you. Yeah, sure. So my name is Leslie Cleaver. Thank you so much for inviting me to join the panel. Um, I started off my career in New York City and did and worked at, you know, big law firms. Um, then I moved back home to Houston, Texas, where I'm from, continued working um, at big law firms. I did corporate securities and M&A. About five, into, five years into that, I decided that I wanted to go in-house. Went in-house to a company called Ignite Restaurant Group. They owned uh, two restaurant brands, Joe's Crab Shack and Brick House Tavern and Tap. Um, about a year into my time there, my general counsel actually left. And so I was named the interim general counsel of Ignite Restaurant Group. We had a very small legal department. It was three attorneys. Um, about two years into my time at Ignite, the company actually went bankrupt. So I left Ignite and then went over to the Houston Astros. And I was senior counsel for the Houston Astros for four and a half years. Um, and after four and a half years, decided that um, I was ready to become a GC. Um, and I went on to become the general counsel at Aceable Inc. I started at Aceable uh, June of last year. So I am about eight and a half months into my first uh, GC role. And hi everyone. And thanks again for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, so I'm general counsel at the Internet Society. Um, our mission is to make internet for everyone. We build, defend, and promote the internet. Um, it's about a 30-year-old uh, nonprofit uh, founded by the father of the internet, Windsor. But before the Internet Society, I was, this is actually my second general counsel role. Um, my first general counsel role was at um, another very mature company um, um, where I was brought in as their first internal counsel to build their function from scratch and um, set up legal and compliance function. Um, before that, I had a little bit of a longer career um, that, as you can tell, I'm not from the United States. My accent will give that away. So I was born in Moldova, which was, uh, which is a former Soviet Union Republic, um, born and raised there, went to law school there, and immigrated here about 25 years ago, and I had to do it all over again. So I went to college and law school here, um, worked full time to put myself through college and law school, and then was in um, two different law firms, um, clerk two different law firms until I ended up in house. So I was at, at a few technology companies until I joined um, my previous company as their first GC. Thank you for that, Ilona. And now that we're we're sharing where we're from, my accent does come out occasionally. I was also born and raised in Eastern Europe. I was born in Croatia and I attended law school in Croatia before immigrating here 22 years ago. And then I went to law school here at University of Georgia and uh, then fell in love with recruiting. So there you go. I thought I would add that. Um, Ilona, let's, let's stay with you for a sec. When did you know that you wanted to be a general counsel and what steps did you take to get there? Like, was it all perfectly planned out or did it kind of organically happen? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, no, no, no perfect plan here. Um, the, my career had a few twists and turns and a lot of it was being in the right place at the right time, but a lot of it was also due to working hard, saying yes to challenging assignments, assignments that nobody wanted to do. Um, I actually had a kind of a, a rocky start to my legal career because I've been always focused since going to law school back in Moldova, I was focused on becoming a lawyer and that's all I wanted to do and worked really hard to accomplish that. And then after a great clerkship, I ended up in a law firm and I loved my colleagues. I hated practice of law and I thought I made a mistake. I thought that was all that hard work was not, never going to pay off because it's just not for me. And um, after about six or seven years, I focused on getting in-house job and ended up in a litigation at Sprint and loved it. And it was the right fit. I realized that there's so much more I can do with my legal career um, than just law firms. And um, knew that what I was really good at was big picture, focusing on big picture, seeing kind of the plan and then breaking it down in smaller steps and counseling the business on how to get there. Um, 
So I also love having one client um, business focus of, of my job and realized early on that, especially in a large company, you can be as active as you want or you can be as passive as you want in your legal career, in, in your in-house role. And being active and not only active, but being proactive meant that I identified certain gaps in counseling on issues um, and coverage and I would raise my hand to handle those. That gave me an opportunity to expand my skill set. Um, I think you asked when I wanted to be, when I realized that I wanted to be a GC, and I can't really pinpoint the exact moment, um, but I do know that what I started doing a few years into my tenure uh, at Sprint was look at LinkedIn profiles of general counsel. And so I just looked at as many of them as I could found, find to look at their resumes to see what type of skill sets they had. And I essentially was writing my own GC profile. So I was trying to figure out what skills do I need to get there. And Dina, to your point, um, the GC role doesn't come with the manual. Getting there also doesn't come with a manual. And it, it is a very different path for everyone. But if you, so kind of big picture, setting a goal and then breaking it down to steps, that was my way of getting there, is looking at what other successful GCs had on their resumes and then building my own resume and then filling in the gaps. I love that. How about you? Um, so, you know, I aspired to be a GC um, when I first began my in-house career. Um, my 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 then GC, her name was Robin Martin. She was the inspiration. Um, just watching how she handled business and legal issues. I mean, I was at awe, and I was just like, I want to be that type of lawyer. So that's when I aspired. Um, and you know, was you know, was everything kind of mapped out for me? Absolutely not, right? Um, you know, I didn't have a lot of control over the types of opportunities that presented themselves to me, right? but I did have control over which opportunities I accepted and which opportunities I rejected. Um, for me, what was very important was that for every role or opportunity that I accepted, I had to be gaining a, a new skill or a new set of experiences. Um, and I remember, you know, there were positions that I was offered at really great companies and really stable companies, but I had to decline those positions because I felt that it would be a step back in my career. Um, and, and I will say there is something to be said about working at a small legal department, right? Um, throughout my entire legal career, I've been at very small legal department, very small legal departments, two to three attorneys. Um, and when you're working in a, a department that size, you know, it's all hands on deck. You get to learn so much about so many different areas of law. Whereas where if you're in a larger legal department, sometimes you're like, you know, you're put in different groups such as the employment group or the commercial contracts group. So my recommendation, if you wanna be a general counsel to think about, you know, working in a small legal department so that you can develop, you know, your skills at a more rapid pace. Yeah, and I, I will echo that, Adina, if you don't um, mind, because, yeah, I think that's such a great point. And I'm looking back at my career and the large um, companies and legal departments of those companies. And to Leslie's point, um, you do pick and choose, um, raise your hand, pick and choose opportunities strategically. And it also taking a risk to go into a less, maybe a less stable company or a smaller company in a startup where you will take on more responsibilities and learn more. Um, another point I would make is relationship building in your journey um, to the GC role. Um, search firms, recruiting, um, I uh, we all heard about picking up the phone when recruiter calls and that's for sure. And that's just to me as a common courtesy, but I actually would suggest to go a step further I, I think of relationships as value building. So how can I bring value to folks like Adina? Um, can I offer you a um, conference that you can go to and build new relationships that I know you'll find some really good connections at? Is there a search that I can help you with? So um, can I put you in touch with someone uh, that I think would be valuable to you? So thinking of building a relationship with the recruiting firms building relationships within your network with general counsel um, and I 
hope that I'll get over 100 LinkedIn invites as a result of this because I do want to mentor people and um, if they're interested, I would love to help in their journey of becoming general counsel. But we always get or frequently get a question, do you know of somebody because I'm looking for to fill this role or do you know of somebody who might be a good fit for this? Um, and then uh, your outside counsel, don't disregard that. Um, there are, as Edina mentioned, somebody from outside one in house, but a lot of times outside counsel get the opportunities and they'll pass along if they know that you're looking for a GC job. All great points, all great points. And I have to add, I did not place Ilona and Leslie in their current roles, so they're not just being nice to me here. <laughs> Yeah, but they always pick up the phone when I call and, and when I ask for referrals or, or ideas. We, that's what it's all about. It's about relationship building and maintaining those relationships. And we'll talk some more about internal and external relationship building later um, today. Now, Leslie, I would love to hear from you. Um, I, I want to know when or how did you know and at what point did you know that you were ready? And before you answer, I have to share this story. I just love this story. So I met Leslie before she took on her first GC role. We met and I knew she was ready. She was not a GC then, but I knew she was ready. She knew she was ready. And I always say it's my job to recognize, to recognize people who are going places. And I knew that Leslie was going places. Sure enough, about six months or so after we met, Leslie called me and shared her great news, shared her GC role with me. So uh, tell me, how did you know, when did you know that you were ready? That is a great question. And the story behind this meeting is a really amazing story. Um, you know, I knew that I was ready when, you know, my then GC was letting me fly solo on really high impact and high profile matters. Um, you know, he basically gave me the keys to the castle and said, just don't burn it down. And when it didn't burn down, I was just like, hmm, maybe I'm ready, right? And when I continue to fly solo on these matters without, with very little intervention from my GC, um, I, and then, and I became more confident and comfortable in my ability to lead, that's when I knew I was ready. Um, and, and I will say I am a young GC, right? I'm only, I was only what, 11 years in. Um, and you know, some people said, you know, you're too young, you, you're, you're just way too young. And you know, when I met Adina, it was actually, I was actually up for a position. And you know, I was the youngest person on the slate um, but, and I did not get the position, right? Um, but I, you know, called Adina afterwards to get feedback. And that's when she said, no, I agree with you. You're ready. Just keep pushing. Um, and so I kept pushing and I landed my first GC role. Can I share a quick story as well, since we're sharing stories and it's yeah. a kind of a similar <laughs> story, to me, but this is a compliment to you, Adina, because Actually, I think you and I met when I was up for a position that I didn't get either. And it was kind of a similar story where it wasn't a GC role. And looking back at that, um, it was the best thing for me because I ended up where I ended up. But um, Adina, great compliment to you because obviously we're both <laughs> friends of yours even though we didn't land the jobs with you. <laughs> Wonderful. Now everyone's going to think that this is that, that today's chat is all about me. No, it's not. <laughs> so thank you guys. That was a great compliment. Um, now, Ilona, from your perspective, what are the substantive skills necessary um, to kind of build and, and put in your toolbox in order to be a successful, successful GC? Now, of course, this will vary based on the company type and size and industry, public versus private. Um, but what are what are some thoughts that you can share um, there? Yeah, I, I'll highlight a few. Um, going back to my LinkedIn, looking at profiles days, but they really have came in handy because I knew I didn't have them. I only had litigation um, and government investigations uh, at that time, and so I had to figure out what skills do I really need to be an effective uh, in-house counsel and GC role. Um, so it's definitely corporate governance. 
definitely privacy and cybersecurity, and that's where I raised my hand at Sprint and said, I really need to help the company develop our cybersecurity um, program. So that helped um, litigation, risk, and dispute management, compliance, um, obviously labor and employment, um, executive compensation. And I would add, although it's not a hard skill, but um, global and international experience, anytime you can expand your skills in working with other cultures or working in global companies, um, it's huge. Um, on that on that one, um, ISAC, the Internet Society, uh, ISAC, is a truly global organization. And when I say global, I really mean it. We are in parts of the world I've never even heard about before I joined the Internet Society. But that also means that I never know which issue I will work on in that particular day. Um, what compliance issue I'm going to run into, the expert laws, employment laws in 30 plus countries. So my biggest challenge is staying on top of that, but most importantly is learning to understand and be sensitive to cultural differences. And up until this job, I, I gathered some of that for my other jobs, but this is really the first time when I realized how global companies are and how you have to be very sensitive to cultural differences and how people work um, in order to be effective and efficient. And I think the way, obviously, our world is going and the more global we become, I think that's one of the key skills to add to your to your um, skill set. Wonderful. And, what about you, Leslie? And Alana, I'll add to that list. I would say also, you know, commercial transactions and M&A, um, employment law is a big one. I'm, you know, talking with our HR department every single day about an issue, um, understanding intellectual property and your intellectual property portfolio, um, and of course, litigation. And that's not to say that you have to be an expert in all of these, right? Um, because that's why you have outside counsel to add some depth to your expertise. But you do have to know enough to be dangerous, right? Because you're going to have to guide outside counsel. You're going to have to develop a strategy with outside counsel, and you're going to have to advise your business folks because outside counsel is not always going to be there, and they're going to look to you to be the first person to guide them on those matters. So, wonderful. Um, we received a question that I think uh, we could probably answer here. It's a good good place to to, to introduce this question. Um, it, it says, do you have any suggestions for those that aspire to be a public company GC um, to gain the SEC board um, corporate secretary exposure that will make them viable candidates for those types of opportunities? Um, I can I can take that one, and I don't know if Ilana and, and Leslie, you want to add anything to it, but um, you you for our, all of our public company GC roles, that board exposure SEC experience is an absolute must. Um, and all of our clients are looking for that. Um, in terms of getting that experience, um, if you're not an SEC um, lawyer trained at uh, an AMLAW 100 or 200 law firm, if you're already in-house and you're at a public company and you're trying to get exposure, um, it, it may be a little more difficult once you're in-house and you're not you did not come in as, as an SEC lawyer, but there are ways. And uh, going back to what um, you two mentioned earlier, you know, raise your hand, look for exposure, look for, for new opportunities, um, look for more work directly with the general counsel, with the corporate secretary, if it's not the same person. Um, just try to get um, maybe some committee work as well. Um, Direct exposure to the board may be difficult, but kind of take small steps to get there and make sure that people who can expose you to that area know that that's, that's what you're interested in. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add. And I, and I would also say, you know, a small legal department would help, right? When I went into Ignite, I came in as their SEC lawyer, but our general counsel was a litigator. Um, and so I found that we were learning off of each other, right? I was learning litigation from her and she was learning the SEC work from me because it was just the two of us, right? So going into a smaller legal department will will give opportunities to learn new things. Yeah, and I was I was gonna 
say the exact same thing, um, Leslie, going into a smaller legal department, also going into companies that might be pre-IPO. Um, and Adina, I know the market is, is very hot and a lot of companies are hiring a lot of companies that are considering IPO at some point in the future are hiring. So maybe it's also that relationship building with a recruiter where you make that known that I don't have that skill set yet. I aspire to be a GC in a public company. I need some SEC experience. Can I go into, would you let me know if there is an opportunity to go into a you know, small legal department where I'm second or third lawyer where I can get that? alongside the general counsel. I think that would be a great practical step. And I, what I can do in those, in those scenarios, those situations, I can keep those candidates in mind. Um, you know, I represent clients in the marketplace, but going back to relationship building, I, I, I love helping out and developing those relationships and keeping people on my radar um, for future opportunities. So absolutely. Um, what about the soft skills? that one needs in order to be a successful um, successful GC. Leslie, you wanna take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, mine falls under the umbrella of communication. Um, it's word choice, right? Um, you know, you're gonna be working with people of all walks of life. We have Leslie, did we lose her? We might've lost Leslie. Ilona, why don't you take us down? Sure. Um, right. Yes, I agree. Um, yeah, um, so communication, um, I would say good judgment, good decision making, um, being a leader, being a visionary. Um, so those are interesting because you don't, in a non-GC job, you usually don't, um, you're, you're not in a position of leading, um, but once you switch over that becomes your priorities to lead and leading for me means earning my team's respect and which in turn then will turn to a higher degree of effort um political savvy um also knowing when to stand up for your um self and for your team um difficult conversations having those difficult conversations is so key um learning how to have those conversations or you accomplish what you need, but you also get um, but you also get across your point. Flexible thinking, I would say uh, one of the muscles I really had to develop uh, in my career, um, having a growth mindset. <laughs> it's funny. Um, I have a it's such a it's such an important skill. My seven year old and I have a um, book with exercises on growth mindset, and um, he always reminds me. <laughs> you can't do something yet. And he loves telling me that it's yet. So really focusing on flexible thinking, having growth mindset, and finally figuring out your, your company or your future company cultural expectations, um, making sure that you are aware of what the culture of the company is and how to adjust to that culture is, is super important. Yeah, absolutely. I. Um... You know, I, I look at what we do here at Major Lindsay as, as matchmaking. It's like dating, right? There's a math test and there's chemistry test. Math is, you know, do the numbers add up? Can you do the job, right? Look at your resume. Have you done this? You check the boxes. But then the chemistry test, that's the other half of the equation, right? And making sure that that cultural fit is there is, is so tremendously important. And it goes both ways. It has to be the right fit for the candidate and the company. And I, every now and then I get candidates who are just so disappointed if they don't get the role. And then they realize that, you know what, maybe it was not a good cultural fit. And that's fine. You know, that's fine. Not every opportunity, even though it may look great on, on paper, not every opportunity is going to be that perfect cultural fit. And it is really important to assess that throughout the interview process. So absolutely agree with you. Um, yeah. And I would add to that that it's it's also you you might look good on paper and come across great in interviews and you get there and the cultural and you realize the culture might be a little different or not what you expected. And it's always important to be, again, flexible thinking, be able to adjust to culture. 
be able to, because you, you have to be flexible. Um, the only way you will be an effective general counsel is if you adjust and adjust the culture and speak their language. I'll give you a perfect example. Um, I was never on Zooms in my other jobs. I was All my conference calls were without video. Well, this company does video all the time. So you're on a video. And as much as I don't like staring at myself all day long, I'd rather have a phone call. It's on the video. Um, even more so because we are so global, sometimes all those calls are recorded. And so you have to be flexible. And you know, sometimes I cringe, do I really want to record the call? Yes, you do, because somebody in Africa will have to watch the call um, or you know, in other parts of the world because they can't join. So you have to be able to adjust to that culture. Absolutely. Um, what about... Hey, Adina, um, I'm chatting with Leslie. Her internet went out. Oh, there she is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm using my hotspot. So. <laughs> oh, you're amazing. I'm glad you were able to hop back on. <laughs> we're actually still, yeah, we're still on the uh, soft skills question. So go ahead. What do you think matters when it comes oh, okay, to? Great. Yeah, we're, we're, we haven't moved on. <laughs> go ahead. I think we lost. I hey, think you're lost. frozen again. <laughs> you know, technology is great when it works. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's give. Uh, yeah. Let's give. Let's, yes. We so, are. Um, you know, you're working in stressful environments, and you're probably working with a lot of. Am I? You're going in and out. Maybe we should do um, a dial in. What do you think, Heather? Yeah, Leslie, stay on camera and then click on the console where it says um, audio and click to dial in. And, um, and at least your camera will hear you better, if that makes sense. But your audio, your camera will stay up. And you'll just have to mute your speakers. Sorry, everybody. Technology still. <laughs> no worries. I think she's probably listening to the prompt that says about the call. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bear with us for a second. We'll be back. Adina? Yes. Okay. Now I'm on my phone. This is, this is crazy. I haven't had any <laughs> internet issues until today. <laughs> So okay. no worries. I was telling you about my my scare earlier today on Teams. So all good. We're still on the soft skill question. Well, I was gonna say that's why my job and my company's job is so important because we're making internet for everyone. <laughs> Make internet for Leslie too. Yes. <laughs> oh no, we can't hear you. <laughs> I don't know what happened. You can hear me now, right? Yes. Okay. So, so soft skills would be um, word choice, right? Making sure that the words that you are using are perceived and received in the way that you intend them to. Um, like I said, you're going to be working in high stress environments, um, and you want to make sure that everybody understands what you're trying to say and you're eliciting the, the correct emotional response from people. That, that is difficult for me because I'm a very blunt person. Um, and so I've actually had to hire a coach, a career coach. And one thing that we are working on is communication and word choice. Um, so that, that is one thing that I think is a soft skill that is necessary. Wonderful. And one thing that came out out of our uh, general counsel, first general counsel survey, first time GC survey report was that most experienced GCs said that new in-house leaders should first focus on listening and building relationships. So can you tell me sort of which groups of, of, of people or internal stakeholders and outside the company should one focus on when it comes to relationship building? 
this question is for me? Yeah, let's go with you while we still have you. Okay, that's fine. Um, you know, so we all know that this profession, in this profession, relationship building is key, right? It, it, it just, relationships matter. Um, and both internal and external relationships, you know, I'm going to focus kind of talking about my external relationships because those have been very meaningful and very impactful to my career. Um, you know, as a young attorney and throughout my career, I've had you know, that personal board of directors of really amazing attorneys who were very committed to seeing that, to making sure that I was successful in my career. You know, I could provide them with the uncut stories of what was going on in my life and in my career. And they could provide me with very authentic advice about how to navigate my career, how to, uh, you know, fill gaps in my professional development and gaps in my emotional intelligence, because that is important. Um, you know, one thing that I've noticed as I have, as I have progressed in my career, um, that the board of directors that I had in the beginning and the middle of my career has shifted a little bit, right? Some of the people that I had on my board of directors are, prob are no longer on my board of directors, not because there's any issue, but because I've, I've learned that, you know, as I progress, you know, my professional needs become different. And the advice that I need is different. And the questions that I have are different. And for a while, uh, you know, I, it was difficult for me to kind of come to terms with that. But now I just think it's okay, right? You know, you, the things that you need shift. So that, so that board of directors should change over time. Yeah, and I'll focus on the relationships you don't choose because it sounds like uh, the the external relationships that Leslie just talked about are ones you choose, the ones you end up with internally are not the ones you choose, you're stuck with them. And so how do you build those relationships? Because as Adina and Leslie mentioned, those are absolutely key to success. So I made sure that when I joined a company um, that I communicated clearly to everyone that I am not here to do something right away. Um, I am here to listen and I had my listening for, so it was my 100 day plan to just go around the company and listen. And um, that's how I use the listening tour for two reasons. One is to learn as much as I can about stakeholders and about where people fit in within the organization, who are the decision makers, who carry some weight that I may need to rely on, um, and then also for substance gap analysis. But that relationship building, that trust is a lot of work. It really is a lot of work. Um, and that I would make um, as a priority in by joining this to, is to build those internal relationships. You need to understand your audience, you need to understand their goals, their objectives, their values, their interests. And you have to be able to, again, be flexible to switch your approach to different groups and individuals. And that actually happens a lot more often than one would think because you have put in a lot of work into getting to know one group and your, your peers, your C-suite and group. And then there's a different group where you have to switch your approach to get to start from scratch. And, and one thing that Alana said is that the relationship building is a lot of work. If it's not a lot of work, then that means that you're not doing it right. So that's what I've learned. Because um, it is a lot of work. It's not a situation where you have one conversation, right, with somebody and, you know, poof, there's a relationship. It, it really requires a consistent cadence of communication with people internally and externally to build the types of relationships that will really, you know, change your career. Yeah. So consistent, thoughtful communication, right? That's that's. I, I agree with that. Um, now, Ilona, you might have started actually um, talking about what I'm about to ask you. I think part of your previous answer may go here too. You know, when we think about some of the actions that you need to take during the first, let's say, month, three months, or the first year, what comes to mind for, for a first time GC? Yeah, so I would say that your first month um, actually begins before your first day, your first official day. 
And um, the reason I say that is because I really spent a lot of time preparing for the first day um, of my new juicy role. And I did, did a very deep dive into materials that I found on the company, the information that I gathered during the interview. Um, so I looked at the corporate governance documents, read the bylaws, read each other's, researched the industry, looked at um, the competitors to see what issues they're facing and the issues that I might need to focus on first. Um, so, of course, for public companies, I know yeah, we had at least one question on public companies, but it's that course, in, in the course of recent the analysis of the, um, the, I'm sorry, the earning calls or the analyst calls, um, those are key, very important to become aware of what CEO or CFO of the company or analysts are focusing on. And then the first 100 days, I, I do think of it as 100 days. It's good for a president, it's good for me. Um, so I think of it as, what is my plan in my first 100 days? And I consider that period to be the most important in, in the GC role because you can either earn the reputation that you want or you can earn the reputation you don't want. And I subscribe to what my mom back in Moldova told me many, many years ago. First, you work for the reputation, then the reputation works for you. And so I value that advice and, and always go by it. But in the first 100 days, I would say, your plan should consist of a meeting, right? The listening tour, um, C-suite, your team, board, if, 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 board chair, if you have access, um, all of your executive peers, the leader of the product lines, other functions. Um, my objectives there was to get uh, an idea of the short or long-term expectations and objectives, understand the strengths and weaknesses of my team. And the result of that is this gap assessment. You really, can, I, I build a blueprint or roadmap for all the gaps that I've identified in my first 100 days and then prioritized my time and the time of my team on closing the gaps. Um, other meetings might be very important um, outside council, um, absolutely, um, to learn what some of the issues that the company has dealt with or might be dealing with, but also important to understand their perspective on your team, because they're, they're going to be hopefully very candid in your strengths and weaknesses of your team. I'll make one more quick point about the, the plan of the readout. Um, I have set, nobody had set that goal for me, but in both roles, I've set the goal of doing a reboot of my gap assessment and my roadmap to the C-suite. And I did it for two reasons. And one is to make sure we're on the same page as far as the priorities for the legal team. But two is I always advocate. I advocate for myself and the team and the value we bring to the company. So to me, that road map and the readout is the way to advocate for ourselves. And and I'll add on one quick thing to what Alana has said. Um, you know, a lot of times, and, and I'm guilty of this too, you know, going into a new role, you feel like you have to change the face of the company and change the world. And we put that kind of pressure on ourselves. Um, and I think really within, you know, the first month and really within the first year, you know, there's, you really don't have to do that, right? Focus on, you know, some of the quick wins and some low-hanging fruit um, that are important to the company. And you should know what's important to the company if you're spending the first few months just listening and learning. You'll know what, uh, what the low-hanging fruit is that you can, you know, change or make an impact in that, that will be beneficial to the company. Uh, Leslie, uh, let's stay with you for, for, for this one. What was the biggest challenge you encountered in your role when you first stepped in? That's a really good question. Um, I think for me, the biggest challenge has been the level of expectation for me to be a business person that happens to be a lawyer. Um, you know, my CEO has made it very clear that yes, he wants my legal expertise, but what he values the most is my business expertise. So we're having, you know, we have uh, weekly executive meetings. I have 
one-on-ones with my CEO on a regular basis, um, and we have quarterly strategic meet- uh, strategy planning meetings. Um, and there is an expectation for me to make recommendations, right? So I need to make recommendations on how to improve our average order value or improve our market share. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been difficult, right? Because number one, you know, I'm used to, you know, really providing legal advice, right? Because that's what I'm good at. Um, and, you know, when you're in a position, a new position and you're learning the business, right? And you're still expected to provide that business advice. It can be, uh, it can make you a little apprehensive. And also you just don't want to say anything stupid, right? <laughs> you want, you want people to view you as an intelligent person and you don't want to make any missteps. Um, but I really will credit, you know, my CEO and my career coach because they both have really encouraged me to be vocal. And my CEO has made it very clear that he values my voice. And he's even said to me, you know, if, you know, you have an idea or have, have a recommendation and you don't want to say it in our executive team meeting, pull me aside. We can have a one-on-one and talk about it. And I did that multiple times. And actually, the recommendations I made, he brought that to the executive team. And so, you know, I'm feeling a lot more confident and comfortable um, in me being a businesswoman. So. And, and I'll give you a, a, another side of that coin, because I actually, one of the biggest challenges I've had in both jobs, in both roles, was the complete opposite. I had to fight for changing the perception of I'm not just a lawyer and don't invite me here just for legal advice. I want to be in the room to contribute as a as a business partner and as somebody who can really help form the strategy of the company. So it's it's very interesting. It depends on the company you go to. It's very interesting how the experiences could be different. And um, the other challenge I would say is for me at least again probably the the nature of the companies i joined but how much educating i have to do about the role of internal legal counsel um and that all started with very hard work of building trust to make sure that people trust me to then educate them on hey this is actually what my job is all about and so i'll tell you what my job is all about um and that changing the perception and i know we all about um, legal is legal team or legal department is a department of no definitely and so how do you change that and make sure people understand that you're a business enabler and so I love that word anytime I or that phrase anytime I get a chance to use it I use it I'm a business enabler I'm not here to slow down work uh, or worse tell them no and looking back Ilona what do you wish you had known, or what do you wish you had known or done when you first took your first GC role? We can go all the way to your first one. All the way three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I would say it's the realization that the box stops with you. And I up until first role, um, always wanted to believe that the box stops with me, but obviously there were decisions. Um, makers and stakeholders above me who would make that decision and live with it. But in your first GC role, that is the, you wake up to realizing the box stops with me and I have to make a decision and I have to stand by that decision. And the way I solve that is to make sure that I uh, surround myself with a really good solid team and that team depends on the size of the company is either internal and external or you know, a little bit of internal a lot of external but that is so key is to choose the right people around you yourself with um so i can rely on their counsel to make the right decision and then i always trust my gut so i know it's not a soft skill but that trust is so key um i would also note that it's very important in your interview process to interview the company as well and not to turn down or appear obnoxious or um or appear like you're not excited to be interviewed but really to information gather. and it's important because 
you would be actually showing that you're thinking about the job strategically and you're trying to do your due diligence. It will give you a lot of information that you can then make an informed decision whether it's the right role or even if it's not the right role, do I still take it? And then how am I gonna fix the things that I think are red flags, right? So it's that informed decision. So interviewing the companies is, is a key. How about you, Leslie? What do you wish you had known or done when you took the role? Yeah, one, I actually wanna go back to one thing Alana said, when she said, the buck stops with me. Um, that is very important uh, because, yeah, you are the decision maker. And I remember in my first role with Robin, she was telling me, there's no safety net. Start operating now like you have no safety net if you want to become GC, because when there is, really is no safety net, you'll be able, you'll be more comfortable, right, operating in that capacity. So that is, that is right. The buck does stop with you. Um, also, I also, I also think, you know, interviewing. I, I wish I would have approached the interviews very differently. Um, all of my interviews, really, right? Because when you're going for your first GC role, you are trying to really sell yourself and you're just looking for, you know, big red flags that would make you not want to work at a particular company. But one thing that I neglected was to focus on some of the details, right? And really get into those details because it will affect, you know, the way that you practice at the company, right? Understanding a lot about the company's performance to the extent that those things are not confidential. You know, maybe meeting some of the board members. Um, getting to understand a little bit more about the executives and, um, you know, the dynamics between them and meeting more executives, learning about, you know, the resources available to the legal department and what the budget is. You know, those are all questions that, that should be asked. And I didn't ask a lot of those questions. And largely because this was my first time interviewing for a GC role. So I didn't know to ask, ask those questions. But, you know, if I were to ever find myself looking for another opportunity, I would definitely, definitely ask those kinds of questions. Yeah, I would say a, a very telling question, and I love this question um, in all my interviews, I ask it. If I were to offer this job and we're sitting here 12 months from now, what does success or what does my great performance look like? What does that mean to you? And you can ask that question in a nice way and without crying, but you'll get a lot of information because that will identify some of the things that you know you can want you to fix or some of the things that bother them and they want you to fix them. So I, I would stress that question too. Wonderful. Um, time flies. <laughs> it's two fifty four. I want to make sure that we leave a few minutes for uh, for a couple more questions here, but. What is your biggest advice? I want to hear just one, your greatest advice for, for our listeners who are aspiring to become GCs or maybe who are in their first first GC role. Yeah, I'll, I'll make it quick. So I would say make sure to figure out why are you aspiring to be GC, what really attracts you to that role, and then the type of company and the size of company you'd like to be GC in because that is really helpful um, in building up to that role. Um, and then once you do have the job, the priority for me was um, building the right team. And I mentioned the, the value of the team, the right team before. Um, and my lens for what the right team is, is staying humble, hungry, my reputation for the team is to always be client focused and humble because overconfidence leads to overlooking issue issues. Hungry because in our profession you never stop learning and being client focused because let's be honest, we need our business folks they need us. Wonderful. How about and you? My advice would be quick. Um, really, just lead with confidence, right? Once you have made the decision that you want to be GC and somebody that you trust co-signs that you are ready for the position, stand on that and be confident in that. Don't vacillate. 
You know, when you're looking for a, a GC role, you may not get the first one, second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one, but you may get the sixth one. If you don't get some of the first jobs, don't say, oh, well, maybe I should go for an associate general counsel position. No, you go for the GC role, right? Because that is what you said you're ready for and you're confident in that. So just leave with confidence. I love that. I love that. So here's a question that actually um, I think kind of goes, goes nicely with what you just said. Um, the question, the question is this, is it more important to become a GC even if it's at a smaller company or government entity um, if you are now at a larger company? There's a concern here about how it might be viewed if one, one eventually transfers, wants to transfer back to a larger company. From, from where I sit, taking a step down in terms of company size in order to take a step up in the future, you know, if, if you take a GC role at a smaller company, that, 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 I see that often actually. I see that often. I don't see any issues with later transitioning to a larger company because you already have that large company experience. This is not in a GC. Right. But you did gain that GC experience in a different company. So you actually have both. And getting it at a smaller company may bring certain things that, that being a GC, you know, at a, at a larger company um, may not be right away. The amount of work that you get exposed to it that you may be leading and, and you may have to be more scrappy when you're at a smaller company, which is a fact mm -hmm. in a lot of companies if, if you decide to take that next step up after that smaller company. Now, being a GC for a, go a government entity, that's a different story. And we can, we can talk about that another time. It, it all depends on, on which government entity we're talking about. Um, any thoughts there, Christoph? Yeah, I'll, I'll add another wrinkle to that. Um, going to a nonprofit, which is what I did. So I went from a for profit um, GC of for profit and then going into nonprofit. And I've been told by some folks that, why would you do that? And that's going to be awful. And what are you going to, it's going to be a sleepy job. I've never slept less in my life. Um, and so it's all about what skills you think that job will give you does that you know challenge you enough does that give you enough runway for whatever the next job is and to be honest with you i'm approached by um folks offering to interview for gc jobs in for profit and so it's it's not a um i think it's more of what are you going to gain from that job um is is the question well Thank you. Thank you both so very much. We're actually up on our time. I know Heather will be joining us here in a sec. And thank you to all of our attendees. Um, this was fun. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, so thanks again thanks for joining for us. Thank you guys. I appreciate everybody sticking with us with a little technical difficulties there. It's not a great webinar if there isn't a little bit of a tech issue, in my opinion. So um, one thing I just want to mention that's kind of related but not really is every every two years, uh, Major Lindsay in Africa does a biannual um, in-house comp survey. It helps us really understand compensation, especially for women, especially for, for minorities. If it hasn't hit your inbox yet, look for it. I'm also going to share the link. I'm not gonna lie and say it takes a minute. It takes about 10. Um, Dina knows she helped write it. So um, we really would appreciate you taking it. We have about 35, 100 comp um, compensation professionals that take it every year that are in-house. So the more that people take it, the more transparency we have into um, wages and salary, especially with this great resignation that's going on. So we really encourage you to take the compensation survey. I will send it around with the recording later. Thanks again to both you ladies. I so appreciate this. Um, we had a bunch of questions about women um, GCs and people were thrilled that we had women GCs on this call. And we obviously didn't get to all your questions. Um, and I'm going to make Adina look at them and see if she decides she wants to yeah, I would love answer. to answer all of them, actually. So, but, we just ran out of time. <laughs> yeah, so thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon. And um, if you're on the East Coast, enjoy this little heat wave we're having. So <laughs> take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.